Hi everyone, I'm Carlota Pico from The Content Mix, and I'm excited to be here today with Simon Truscott, who is PR and Social Media Manager at FIS and has over five years of experience in marketing and communications. Welcome, Simon, and thank you so much for joining us today on The Content Mix. Hi, thank you very much for having me. It's great to be here. (laughs) The pleasure is ours, Simon. (laughs) To get this interview started off, I'd like to learn a little bit about your background, a bit about FIS, and how you got into your current role. Yeah, so um, FIS, first of all, um, I always explain it. Basically, we advance the way the world pays banks and invests because we have these three business arms and they um, basically serve the financial technology world in all these three ways. So um, that's that's basically what they do. Yeah, what I do there is uh, work in the, the digital side of PR and social. So it's a really good role, really, like really enjoy working there and, and the, the, the breadth of it. But um you said, how do I get into it? Basically, doing a language degree. So obviously, love Europe and, and the culture and France particularly. But um, for me, it was always about, okay, what am I going to do afterwards? What am I passionate about? What can I do? What, what are my skills? And um, I don't actually use my French anymore, which is a shame, right? But um, I've always loved writing things and comprehension and um, copywriting and, and that kind of thing. And so I guess marketing was a natural, uh, a natural fit for me. Okay, excellent. I would love for you to define what PR means because Mm -hmm. every single person defines PR in a different way. I used to be in PR myself. I was leading promotional campaigns for countries and for governments worldwide, well, mainly in emerging markets. And PR may mean something different to me than it means to you. So for our audience, could you define what PR means to you, please? Yeah. um, So my first job was in PR team at... um, at Toyota Europe um, in in the UK, and um, I, I just think that social media and PR are so linked, or or they should be, because it's all about reputation management first of all. I think, and on on a better level, it's about helping consumers and just the general public and shareholders and everybody everybody with an interest and everybody without an interest. You know, it's about helping people to understand what we do and how it can help them. I think that that's what I see PR as. It's it's you know it's defensive. But it's also a kind of offensive where you're trying to to really get the message out there. So in that way, it's kind of linked with branding and and, and that kind of thing. Okay, Axel. Well, this leads me into my next question. As PR and social media manager for a fintech company, what kind of skills do you need to be effective in your role, Simon? Yeah, so I mentioned copywriting. Um, and that sounds like, okay, what's that? Because we have copywriting teams uh, at FIS. And I think a lot of big companies do. But basically the skill of being able to um, to put something into words uh, on paper. As I, you can probably tell I'm better at doing it on paper than in words in there. But um, yeah, writing down the basics of, of, of the, the message and getting that message across um, in a kind of news writing way. So, so one of my internships when I was younger was with Autocar magazine. And I was told there like, no, no, scrap this, get rid of that. And, and that was quite harsh, you know, but actually it was really invaluable um, to be told how to keep the essence of what you need and delete the rest. And, and I think that's a, a really good skill, but also, you know, prioritization, stakeholder management, all of these things that we all do in our jobs. And I think one of my best friends actually said something really quite insightful was, um, you know, 70% of anyone's job is people management, um, replying to emails. I was like, that's really dull. How can that be true? But actually, if you think about the time you spend on what you love doing and what you're really good at, it's only like this proportion. And your job is to try and do more and more of what you're good at and kind of prioritize and, and, and just do more of, of your, your skills, whatever they are, whether that's design or writing or just trying to maximize your time doing those things. Simon, I do want to zoom into your social media channels. Could you run through your social media accounts on Facebook, Instagram, any other channels? And also, I'd like to ask you how you determine success for those social media accounts. Yes. Uh, it's a good question because I think social media has come a long way, but basically our accounts at FIS, because we're a B2B company, our biggest one is actually LinkedIn because obviously it's professional network. It's um, it's where we see the most growth um, and the most engagement, but that doesn't mean that we should ignore those other channels. So yeah, we have we also have F, the WorldPay side. So we have FIS and WorldPay channels, but um, we do believe in really keeping things as simple as possible. So we don't have masses of accounts, but um, we just try and differentiate for each channel. In terms of engagement, we do kind of have a, a metric across all of them because we feed into PR and we 
we have to, you know, prove the reach that we're getting and prove the engagement that we're getting. For me, it's always about engagement rates, uh, you know, that, that magic percentage of how many people actually ca- uh, cared about this content, because that's how I can best explain the value that we bring. Well, all of these people clicked or shared or liked or um, whatever it was. So, yeah, I would say the big one is that engagement rate. But for being on the PR team, a lot of it is awareness as well. So I think impressions are still important for us. But if nobody cares about what you're putting out there, then, um, you know, you, you need to rethink it. Yeah. Okay. So in terms of goals, you're looking at engagement, number one, and then number two would also be impressions. Yeah. I mean, I would put it that way around. It depends the campaign because people might come to us and we're trying to always ask them what the purpose is, you know, so why are you putting this out here? You know, we don't want any tick boxing, just, okay, put it on social, which in any company that that can happen. Um, We're always trying to, to make sure that, okay, is this about lead generation? Is this about purely awareness about this new brand image or product? Or is this engagement you want people to actually share their feelings and thoughts? Um, so those are all different goals that you have to try and, it depends the campaign. But overall, I would say, yeah, engagements and then impressions for me, but um, it, it depends. And you're obviously coming at it from a PR mentality as well, which will affect the goals that you set for your social media accounts. Okay, Simon, what tools do you use to monitor your channels? So we use Sprinkler, which is a, a big and quite powerful social tool which we've kind of done some work to integrate that with PR, so the listening side, and also just the way that we publish and everything in one place. But in the past, I've used Hootsuite, you know, um, all sorts of different platforms, um, and all the way back to basic ones. I can't remember the names, but yeah, it's it's good to see that how things are becoming so integrated and customizable and, and just answer our needs a lot better these days. Yeah, definitely. I think technology evolves. As, mm. media, so, as social media evolves as well. And so there's constantly new tools that social media managers can use to listen to their audience mm. better, to engage with their audience in yes. new ways. Okay, what about uh, the rise of user-generated content? How has that impacted your social mm. media approach? Yeah, so again, I, I keep framing things B2B, B2C, because I think for B2B, we've done a lot of work with advocacy for employees. So um, those are kind of our users that generate things um, internally because we have 55,000 employees globally. So as you can imagine, there's a lot coming out and a lot being said. And um, we're doing a lot of work to try and listen and and amplify that. But there's a long way to go. But I think UGC, uh, in, in my previous job, we would spin things into blogs. You know, someone comes and says, I, I've got 10 Toyotas. And we're like, oh, my God, you've got 10? let's do a blog about you and your family and why you love Toyota. Um, so that's the kind of user-generated content that we would do there or maybe collaborate with a photographer or an influencer that's doing something really cool on their Instagram. Whereas now uh, it's a bit different, but yeah, we, we're really trying to, to build up those internal advocates. Mm-hmm. I love how you're using your employees as your shining stars. Like they are yeah. really true influencers and brand ambassadors. And it also says a lot about how proud employees feel about working at FIS, because if they're using their own social channels to talk about their work outside of working hours, I mean, it says a lot about the company. Yeah. I mean, I'd have to apologize if someone internal to marketing came up with it, but I believe that it was generated, this hashtag FIS proud, and um, people love it. You know, I, I was really amazed because... It just shows how people, they just want to say how proud they are to work here. And um, it's a great way of tracking, actually, um, that conversation. But I don't know if it was somebody just came up with it or it was marketing, but we see that a lot. And um, uh, it's a really nice way of of seeing on the internal channels as well. We've got Yammer internally. um, So we can see people sharing their morning coffee now that they're working from home and they've got this gorgeous mountain behind them or something. And you're like, ah, I prefer their office. But, you know, (laughs) these things... Sounds like a fantastic company to work for. Okay. In 1997, Bill Gates coined the now trending phrase, content is king. Taking it to a social media level, what do you think separates good content from great content on social networks? Yes. I mean, that's a great quote. I love these kind of um, advertising and and entrepreneur quotes, uh, the kind of TED Talk, thought leadership stuff. And that sort of brings me to, for us, what we feel is, is really great content and very rich is when you can amplify your executives or employees or specialists, um, you know, the, the sort of internal FIS Bill Gates sort of people, um, whoever they are within the retail side or 
um, you know, we had a, um, a lady doing a blog, uh, sorry, a webinar with um, Vogue Business, and that's really cool collaborations. And mm-hmm. just um, what, what also we've done is um, trying to be really impactful and bold with our visuals and our design, and that's ever evolving. And I think that separates it from bad or from not so good. Um, but in in the past, I've I've done a little bit of work with small businesses just to help them out uh, locally, and what really separates good content for me is um for example the barber shop that's near me he is so passionate about cutting hair you wouldn't believe and what he does is he puts on his instagram all of these really oh i'm so proud of this one and i i i'm i'm really happy to be doing this and he like his passion just shines through and that's his unique selling point uh, is that he just cares so much so it's about really letting those things shine through rather than doing things because you feel like you have to. So I think a lot of small businesses are like, oh, we need to do, we, we have to post something on Instagram. Yeah, but do you have anything to say? Oh, no. Well, you, you, you need to have something to say or what's your purpose? You know, it comes back to what, what are we trying to achieve here? And I think that separates good from bad. Also, the kind of blanket net, one size fits all is something that doesn't always work. I mean, for awareness campaigns, it can, but one thing I really like is when we do work with paid media. Um, and in my previous role a year ago, I was doing paid budgeting and paid media and that kind of thing. And um, it's a really powerful tool as well to um, to target those people who really will be interested and to serve them content, which is going to perform better based on your insights and, and keep switching up. And yeah. That's a really great thing. response, Simon. <laughs> Purpose, I think, is something that we all have to keep in mind as marketing and communication professionals, why we're doing something, why we're writing about a certain topic and how we want our audience to engage with our content. Yes. Okay. What about negative feedback? So from a theoretical PR point of view, how would you manage customers giving negative social media reviews about your service or product? Yeah. So I I feel pretty well versed in this because of my background um, in customer services. Um, So I actually had a a role as a a telephone advisor for the AA with people broken down in Europe and um, everybody had a problem basically. And it wasn't, the problem wasn't with our service, but obviously it's a sensitive situation and it could escalate to that. So then in my Toyota job, it was all about responding to customers directly, you know, the, the, the social media community manager side of things. And um, I think that's a really good foundation for communications career because you're really at the forefront of understanding, listening to the consumer as a whole and as individuals. And um, every day you're managing fires, you're putting out fires, you're trying to give people the answers they need. And sometimes in B2C, you can use humor. So I feel like if it's just a small problem and it's been resolved, you can, there's a lot of emojis, there's a lot of um, hey you're back on the road that's great no worries bye um and and you can be really humorous with that not that that was um and then with b2b i think you've got to be a lot more careful with humor and it's a lot more um you've got to be really careful in in a crisis Mm -hmm. because just because of the scale and also because um the breadth of different consumers that we have or customers um and just be really sensitive to what's going on in their market what we would do i think in, in a theoretical situation is um okay, do we need to shut off all communications digitally? Or can we say something? Do we need to put a statement out? And just cross collaboration between the senior press team, the crisis team, just having a finger on the pulse and doing regular updates with what's, you know, is what's unfolding, if anything. Being able to say, hey, is this over now? Is, is whatever crisis was happening, is it over? Can we start posting again? What should we post? What should we avoid posting? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I always, uh, one of the things that I love to talk about during my interviews, during our interviews is actually the human element of everything that we do. Like regardless of if we work for a B2B company or we work for a B2C company, it's always a human conversation that we're having with another person on the other side of a screen. And Mm -hmm. therefore it's always really important to keep emotions in mind because although a company may not have emotions, the person behind the company or the employees that work for that company will definitely have emotions and they will definitely have opinions. So it's yeah. always really important to keep that human level in mind in whatever we do. Yes. And, and one thing that speaks to that, um, at WorldPay, we've done this um, 
big signature piece of content uh, several years running called the Global Payments Report. And I think in the past we went, hey, here's our Global Payment Report. And then lots of people did care because it's very rich content. But we started pivoting that to actually wondering why the viewer and the customer and the prospect should care about that. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's reframing that message of, hey, it's here. Yeah, so what? Um, To, you know, having some really rich insights and data that speak directly to you as a viewer. So hopefully if you were to see our global payment report content now, it it is much more emotive and um, direct and it doesn't just take itself for granted. You know, all of the stuff that we write is written for the viewer Mm -hmm. or for the reader. So I think that's a, a big switch. Okay, Simon, we are coming towards the end of our interview, but before we wrap up, I want to pick your brain on what you think the future has in store for us. Companies are expected to spend $120 billion in digital marketing by 2021. So that's right around the corner. And a big chunk of this will obviously be spent on social networks. So with that in mind, what do you think the future of social media will look like? Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting one that obviously we're watching carefully. But I think um, in terms of how we've spent money on social before, it's always been, OK, let's put this in paid, uh, paid social, which is really important. But actually, I think video for fintech uh, particularly can be a really powerful tool. And obviously, you need more time invested in it, but also money to produ- um, for production value. We are doing more of that now, and I think we'll do even more in the future. But also, we're doing influencer collaborations. And I think in fintech and in in general for social media, influencer can be a bit of a dirty word. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, what do they bring apart from their following, you know? Um, But actually I really believe in it because in FinTech at least those people are chosen because they're experts and because people care about what they're saying. So investing in in proper collaboration, investing in proper production of video and investing in talent to help us with all of these things. Mm -hmm. I think you bring up a really great point, which is the power of influencers, but not only because of the following of the followers that they have, but also because of their expertise, especially when it comes down to a B2B company, because at the end of the day, what a company wants is to receive content from somebody who knows what they're talking about and not so much from somebody who just has a million followers. (laughs) Exactly. But it's also not just about what they know, it's about how they deliver it. So yeah. we've done a webinar series recently across the world and those people are chosen obviously on their following, but also on um, how their opinions are are viewed in their market and also about how personable they are on camera. Um, and we've had some really diverse and amazing people um, to, to join us for that. So that's been really great. Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. moving into our last set of questions, which are basically your recommendations for our audience. I'd like mm-hmm. to get this section started off with a similar question. What's your source of inspiration, Simon? Who who do you admire professionally or do you follow any influencers yourself? Yeah, um, I think for me, something that really inspires me, I think it's really important for anybody to follow their passion that's separate to work and you can always bring inspiration um so for me that's architecture design um and often so something like design it's a website that um i actually allow to send me emails daily which is crazy because you think how many that is sometimes you know just delete it you're not interested but generally i'll read that every day and it, it it has stuff in there from furniture design and you think well what's the relevance but actually how things are presented and packaged and what their backstory is and then it goes all the way down to some advertising campaigns that they highlight with good design and good copy. So that's a really good way of getting daily inspiration. Okay, Simon. And our last question of today's interview will be an event that you'd like to recommend to our audience and why, what made that event so special? Yeah. So obviously with us all being stuck at home recently, uh, it was really good that there was this um, nudge stock festival, I think it was called um, with one of the ex Ogilvy people um, presenting it and just having really amazing insights from behavioral um to commerce to uh to marketing and just the message basically being that you know the right answer isn't always making sense in terms of data you know empirically this might be what we should do but actually sometimes reason is about emotion and about what people respond to just on a basic random level um so that was really interesting um and also some of the future tools that we might expect to see like ai um, and the way that we can target. And that was really cool. So, 
Excellent. Well, those were great tips and insights, Simon. Thank you so much for joining us on the Content Mix. It was an absolute pleasure to meet you and to get a chance to pick your brain on so many different topics. You too. Thank you so much. I hope that's been useful. And to everybody watching us, thank you so much for joining us on the Content Mix. For more perspectives on the content marketing industry in Europe, check out the Content Mix. We'll be releasing interviews just like this one every week, so keep on tuning in. Thanks again. Have a fabulous weekend, and see you next time. Bye.